Please, uh, may I have your attention for uh, Paul Gardner Stephen? Uh, he is now at night in Australia and uh, he will uh, talk about the Serval project. Uh, he will tell what it is. But uh, it's in relation to the previous talk it, because uh, it will be in use in disaster or after disasters. But he will tell more about it. Paul, I will uh, mute my sound. Sure. Start. Okay. Okay. So uh, thank you, everyone. It's nice to uh, to be at least remotely connected to uh, the second uh, Software Freedom Day uh, in Amsterdam for myself. Uh, so last year it was nice to be able to uh, uh, to join you all there in Amsterdam. But uh, today, uh, back in Australia, so this is okay as well. Uh, so. I guess a little bit of background for the, uh, the Serval project. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are aware. So uh, <clears throat> the Serval project uh, really was something which uh, came about for us after uh, the Haiti earthquake uh, in 2010. And so realizing that the need for uh, resilient telecommunications uh, is very significant uh, if we want to maintain law and order, and particularly in a society like Haiti where uh, they were already facing really uh, very many difficulties. Uh, I, I was very aware that uh, you know, the loss of communications uh, could quite possibly lead to the, you know, uh, to the collapse of law and order uh, in that country. And unfortunately, uh, I heard through uh, people who are working in relief teams there sometime later that uh, that more or less is what happened. And so there was some uh, you know, adversaries of various sorts uh, start feeling free to act and to victimize people. Uh, when they understand that people are uh, vulnerable and unable to coordinate their own responses. And uh, a key part of that, of course, is having uh, communication so that they can coordinate their activities, uh, including the defence of themselves and their communities, uh, with one another. And so, uh, from a, uh, uh, an open source and uh, software freedom perspective, uh, what I observed was that the proprietary mobile phone handsets had the capability to communicate directly with one another and form uh, freestanding networks, but that the uh, carrier-based approach uh, meant that this uh, you know, was never really realized. In fact, uh, for carriers, there are uh, significant fears, uh, whether they are uh, reasonable fears or not, uh, around dilution of their monopoly power uh, if phones are able to communicate without using their proprietary uh, spectrum. Uh, or their expensive uh, infrastructure which they've deployed. And so really it was left to the open source world uh, to do what many engineers in uh, many carriers had known for uh, 30 years uh, was quite possible and it was interesting having a talk with a uh, mobile telecommunications engineer who had since retired uh, here in Australia, hearing that in the 1980s when the analog mobile phone network uh, was uh, you know, it's still de well, actually the early stages of its deployment, I believe, in Australia, that uh, there was talk about enabling uh, analog mobile phones to communicate directly without using the cellular infrastructure, uh, but that they were uh, told very clearly by the upper management that they would not be doing that, that the mobile phones must depend on the carrier's infrastructure uh, to make calls, uh, even though that there was potential uh, you know, life-saving applications for finding uh, lost bushwalkers and these sorts of things uh, in that kind of uh, setting. And so really we've spent the last three years uh, working to combine uh, the best features of uh, CB radio or walkie-talkies uh, with the smartphones that many of us carry around. And of course the advent of Android as a nice open source, or at least mostly open source uh, mobile platform uh, enabled us to make significant progress on this beginning in uh, 2010. So in a few months we had uh, a demonstration in the Australian Outback uh, where we had, that was quite kind of fun, we managed to port uh, the entirety of Asterisk uh, to run on the uh, Google G1 uh, smartphone, uh, which is quite tricky with the Android linker, uh, and to put other bits and pieces so that we could have autonomous meshing uh, by these phones uh, wherever uh, we might take them uh, and, uh, and be able to make phone calls. And later on top of that, uh, you know, through a complete rewrite from that prototype, uh, we've really baked in uh, 
what we think actually is quite a, a nice uh, security framework that's been very nice actually to have recognised uh, most recently in the Global Security Challenge uh, and prior to that in the Technology Challenge for Atrocity Prevention uh, earlier in the year. And I think actually with all of the, uh, uh, the revelations about the extent of uh, uh, interception uh, and uh, you know, monitoring of digital communications of practically uh, all forms and practically all phone calls. I think that this has, uh, you know, it, it adds for, further currency to, pardon me, uh, what we've been doing and the, and the need for communications that does not go through a central uh, you know, uh, national interception point and that has strong encryption built in from the ground up uh, to protect communications even if it does need to, uh, uh, to relay through. So, uh, for our security framework, uh, we kind of we made the observation early on that IP addresses actually weren't that good an idea for uh, a mobile mesh network. For IPv4, uh, there just weren't enough addresses. Uh, due to the birthday paradox, you need uh, double the exponent that you would expect. So, if we want to have uh, four billion people in the world able to have a mesh and mobile phone and move about freely, uh, we would need uh, two to the sixty-four addresses. Uh, in fact, of course, there are actually more than uh, 2 to 32 people in the world, so we need more than 2 to the 64 addresses. So actually, kind of interestingly, it means that IPv6 even doesn't really have uh, enough addresses in the host part uh, of the address space. Uh, but more than that, uh, IP addresses uh, are very easy to spoof, uh, even with IPv6. And we wanted something that, uh, as well as being trivial to uh, you know, provision addresses on a mesh network, with no central authority, uh, that there could be uh, good security uh, for people using it. And uh, so we realised that uh, we could actually use public uh, crypto keys as the native network address. Uh, so our mesh operates uh, doing this and you, uh, as an overlay uh, over IP, so it's running over Wi-Fi, uh, but if we're using packet radio, uh, we can actually carry this uh, natively, and this means that uh, if I want to commence a call uh, to another party, uh, that uh, if I know their network address and I know my own uh, private key that uh, comes with my network address, uh, we can actually do a Diffie-Hellman shared secret agreement uh, and have end-to-end -end encryption. So we still need to deal with man-in-the-middle attacks, uh, but we get uh, encryption uh, for free in a really nice way, and once you've authenticated uh, the other end party, uh, to be sure that there is no man in the middle, uh, you could call them again and have complete confidence, or as near as complete confidence as you could get, uh, that you have a, uh, an unintersceptable, uh, to all the practical intents and purposes, channel uh, to the other party. Uh, of course, this assumes that the NSA hasn't actually broken all elliptic curves and uh, discrete logarithm and factoring prime numbers and, uh, and other things, and you know, perhaps we'll never know. Uh, how much these sorts of organisations know. But I think uh, what is uh, reasonable to say is that the typical adversary to a community in a disaster zone is not going to be able to mount the kind of resources to defeat 256-bit elliptic curve cryptography, um, you know, coupled with robust protection against a man in the middle attack. You know, those people in that situation are going to be able to communicate securely, uh, and this is really nice. And uh, because you can self-allocate an address, uh, you can deploy uh, the network in the field. But one of the really interesting things uh, that we've done, and once this is something very simple, the app can offer itself to download uh, to other phones in the area. Uh, and you know, this is kind of a, a cool little feature. But think now about a disaster zone where only one phone has uh, our software on it we can actually deploy the network through replicating that software onto other phones in the disaster zone without having to get any external resources into that disaster zone. So we have a logistics independent way to deploy um, a secure telecommunications network right where it's needed most. And uh, this we think is actually a really cool uh, and significant accomplishment because of course uh, it's really hard to get people to prepare ahead of time uh, you know, I live in, uh, in Adelaide in South Australia, uh, we're overdue for an earthquake um, and you know, everyone still lives in unreinforced masonry buildings. Uh, after we have the quake I'm sure that will get fixed, but getting people to prepare ahead of time uh, 
uh, is the hard part. And so we anticipate that this is, uh, you know, uh, going to be the same issue for uh, people with their phones in disaster zones. And so being able to uh, install the software uh, at that moment when people suddenly realise the value of it uh, is a very significant advantage uh, and one that we're very pleased about. Uh, one of the other interesting things, if we uh, coming back to security, uh, is if we use a, a normal uh, IPsec or something like that, you actually need to have end-to-end -end links in order to uh, establish the secure channels and uh, you know and do the, the cryptographic verifications and various things to have the communications. Uh, but we realised very early on that with a mobile mesh network, end-to-end -end, uh, connectivity uh, is this wonderful, uh, you know, extremely rare event that happens if you have a mesh network of any size. That we needed protocols that could work uh, where devices, in fact, in the normal case, are isolated from every other device or maybe in contact with just a few nearby, but we want to facilitate communications uh, over much greater distance. So because the network address is the public key, uh, again, uh, and this is actually how we implement uh, text messaging, uh, which is of course uh, encrypted text messaging on the Serval Mesh app, uh, is uh, through a, a delay tolerant uh, bundle protocol. And we can again just do the, the shared secret computation based on uh, the public key of the party we want to send the message to. And we can encrypt the message and put it in a bundle uh, without having to have any uh, reply or other contact from that party. Uh, so it's a, a really nice uh, way uh, to deal with uh, the realistic kind of network situations that uh, you get on these sorts of mesh networks. Uh, one of the other interesting things that we found uh, with that is, uh, you know, again, because there aren't end-to-end -end links, so having your regular mesh routing protocols that have uh, big scaling problems uh, beyond a few hundred nodes, or even actually before that in many cases, uh, we could kind of sidestep that. Uh, and instead of synchronizing uh, routes across the mesh, uh, we figured why don't we simply synchronize uh, the data that people want to share, in particular text messages. So uh, you know, each node advertises all of the bundles of text messages uh, that it knows about. And if any neighboring node doesn't have those bundles, uh, they synchronize over a single hop. Uh, at full Wi-Fi speed, uh, and of course, then this happens, uh, you know, step by step until it eventually reaches its destination. Uh, if all the devices are moving around on the network, uh, in fact, it's not a, not impaired at all. Uh, and so the scale limit uh, becomes one of the amount of data in transit, rather than the number of nodes in the network. Uh, and uh, we're not quite sure how far that scale limit uh, will push. Uh, but what we uh, think is quite clear is that it should be able to scale in many instances well beyond hundreds of nodes, uh, potentially you know, to, to tens of thousands of nodes, uh, and maybe even hundreds of thousands of nodes if each node uh, has only a few conversations going on at any point in time. Uh, and since, of course, people have uh, limited social circles, uh, it's not unreasonable to think that the traffic scale uh, will go up linearly with the, uh, the number of nodes uh, in the network. Uh, so this gives a, a much better scaling behavior than uh, where you're trying to uh, synchronize routes where uh, the traffic scale goes up uh, much faster than linear, typically often uh, as badly as uh, with the square of the number of nodes. So uh, this to us is, uh, uh, is quite an interesting uh, change compared to the typical mesh network structure uh, that we see in, uh, in various other uh, endeavours. And it's, uh, uh, it's kind of interesting as a, an open source uh, project, uh, we've sort of attracted some attention from, uh, from DARPA uh, as well as uh, you know, with some of these competitions that we've entered into the, the security space uh, who see the value in what we're doing. And so it's, uh, it's, uh, it, it's really nice as an open source endeavour to uh, and I, I think as an open source community, we should be proud that we have uh, open source tools and products that are actually uh, interesting enough uh, that you know, the, uh, the establishment uh, has an interest in them. And I think you know, GPG is uh, perhaps uh, the best example of that as well, where uh, you know, it's a, a tool that is tremendously useful uh, through being open. So that's kind of a, the, the core of the server mesh. 
uh, and the civil project. But what we've been looking at recently uh, is how we can break free from the Wi-Fi barrier. Because of course Wi-Fi has limited range uh, and there are horrible interoperability issues with uh, Wi-Fi and in particular ad hoc Wi-Fi uh, on mobile phones. So you need to have root access on most mobile phones to get ad hoc uh, mode. Google uh, seems to be uh, quite actively disinterested in adding uh, ad hoc Wi-Fi support. Uh, if you haven't already uh, starred uh, Bug82 uh, on the Android um, issue tracker, I encourage you to go and do that. Uh, last check, it was the third highest start of any uh, bug remaining in that tracker. Uh, and most of the other bugs that you'll see uh, with similar numbers of votes uh, are more like bug 10,000 or 30,000, not bug number 82. So it's a very long-standing issue uh, and uh, all the encouragement that we can give Google to uh, be bold uh, and add this and not be afraid of uh, upsetting carriers uh, or, uh, or anything else. Or who knows, maybe Google are the recipients of an NSA security letter. Uh, you know, in the, the current environment, uh, who knows? Uh, so why we try and encourage this to be remedied, uh, we've decided the easiest way around it and to show just how uh, silly it is to prevent these phones from being able to do this uh, is we've started working on what we call a mesh extender where we combine uh, a little uh, Atheros uh, based router that supports ad hoc Wi-Fi and access point mode at the same time. Uh, so it can act as an access point for the, uh, uh, you know, the nearby mesh phones uh, and potentially very many of them and then it can do the ad hoc meshing amongst the mesh extenders. Uh, so that's kind of nice. That gives us uh, support for uh, most model of Android phones at the expense of needing some uh, very low cost, uh, but nonetheless uh, some uh, additional infrastructure. Uh, but the, uh, the thing we, we really like with the mesh extenders uh, is that we have designed a servile mesh uh, from the outset to use uh, any arbitrary uh, transport uh, not just Ethernet and Wi-Fi. And so we've added a serial-based uh, packet radio that uh, is normally used with radio-controlled uh, aircraft. Uh, and in the US, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, uh, and a, a bunch of other countries, there is a, a nice piece of spectrum around 900 megahertz, uh, which is an ISM band, much like 2.4 gigahertz uh, for Wi-Fi uh, is an ISM band. And uh, this band propagates uh, much more nicely through walls, as indeed we know from our, our cell phones that uh, you know, the, the penetration is much better than Wi-Fi uh, can do. Uh, we're allowed to transmit with a little bit higher power, and we can use a lower bit rate. And so all of these things combine to give a link budget which is uh, almost 30 dB better than Wi-Fi uh, over typical distances. So even in an urban area, uh, so we did some testing uh, in, uh, in Boston, uh, and in Washington when I was in uh, the United States and we can uh, get a link over a single hop uh, through um, a large office building uh, and to a range of uh, you know, a couple of hundred metres uh, without too much trouble at all. Uh, we can get a link from one end to the other of a 200 metre long uh, subway train. Uh, you know, we can get a, a link over a kilometre uh, across the Charles River in uh, Boston or uh, over uh, about 1300 metres on the National Mall uh, in the US and over several kilometres uh, in rural uh, New Zealand without too much trouble and importantly without having to aim the antenna. So this is something that you can just carry in your pocket or uh, you know have on your shelf or maybe have one fitted into your car uh, and have it form uh, useful mesh networks and communicate over uh, really distances that in some ways are approaching uh, what is possible with uh, uh, you know, high speed 3G uh, in the uh, the microwave kind of frequencies. I mean, it's not uh, quite there, but certainly it's uh, an order of magnitude further than Wi-Fi uh, in built-up areas, pardon me, and uh, potentially uh, a couple of orders of magnitude further than uh, Wi-Fi uh, once you start getting into open country uh, and without having to aim. Uh, and this, we think, uh, will make a, a significant difference in uh, helping people to adopt uh, mesh networking, because suddenly, you know, you don't have to be within 20 or 30 metres indoors uh, to have a link, uh, but you can be much further away and even if the link is a little bit intermittent, uh, our bundle-based protocols uh, for text messaging and uh, uh, once we get a little bit further, a voicemail uh, will mean that you can still have uh, really quite useful, uh, simple, secure uh, and free 
uh, mobile communications. So uh, that's really the, the most of what we've been up to at the moment. I think it would be nice. Uh, now, if anyone has any questions, I'd be very happy to, uh, uh, to answer those. Please put your hand up in the air if you have questions. And probably switch on the microphone. Oh, oh, yeah, uh, disappeared, has he? If, if so, no. He can't hear you. I'm back. So maybe someone. Ah, here we go. <laughs> Are there uh, questions? Has somebody uh, uh, ever used Cerebral? No? Two seconds. You, you hear me talking? <laughs> Yeah, 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 I can hear fine, so this is good, yeah. Um, so yeah, I should have mentioned, you can just, uh, if you search for Serval Mesh on uh, uh, Google Play, or I think it, uh, there's a slightly out of date version on F-Droid as well that you can uh, uh, download, uh, or indeed you can just go to uh, developer.servalproject.org slash files, uh, and you can download uh, the APK direct from there if you're uh, uncomfortable with using uh, the Google Play Store. Okay. Um, uh, you have more to tell, or uh... no? Look, uh, as I say, I, I think uh, I've probably said a, a, enough for now. But if anyone has any questions or anything that they would like uh, me to talk further about, then I will be happy to do that as well. Yeah, I was wondering what you were just told about. Um, uh, Shared bundles. Uh, is mm -hmm. it the same like um, when I spoke with you a month ago? We, uh, you, you told me that something like Big Message is doing, you already did with Serval. That you uh, transported SMS messages to South Africa. And, yeah. And, uh, so that's what you just told that. Uh, someone carries a lot of different uh, messages with him, but yeah. they are also encrypted? Yeah, so that's all encrypted. So uh, because we have this nice property that end-to-end -end encryption is very easy for us to arrange and you don't need a live connection uh, to establish the, uh, the keys, mm -hmm. uh, you can, uh, in an, one isolated area of the network, send a message to someone in another isolated area of the network, mm -hmm. then someone acting as data mule uh, carrying the phone, uh, or maybe you know uh, a UAV running uh, Argue Pilot um, with a phone attached to the bottom mm -hmm. uh, flies over you and then flies over the other area. Uh, the message traffic will uh, automatically synchronize off, and your phone will go beep beep. You have a new message. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it's all uh, transparent and automatic. But you mean that uh, the encryption is easier because you are not um, exposed to the whole world, but only to your local area? Uh, no, it's more, well, once you know the network address of the, uh, uh, the phone you want to c talk to, uh, that is its, uh, its public key for encryption. Okay. Uh, so you don't, you don't have to figure out the key separately. If you, if you know who you want to talk to, that is their public key. Okay. okay. Uh, so it, it makes uh, encryption really, really simple. In fact, we've actually made the, uh, the API so that if you want to send an unencrypted packet, you actually have to manually uh, set a flag on the packet before you dispatch it. Uh, and so you kind of have this interesting behavior to send a, a broadcast packet. Uh, you have to turn this flag off, otherwise uh, the servo uh, packet engine will actually come back and say, hey, no, you can't send a broadcast packet because it's marked encrypted. Uh, you have to mark it unencrypted uh, and try again. But uh, if you <coughs> already looked at the big message, uh, no, I, I, I must admit that uh, we haven't. But, I mean, would uh, some form of... Uh, uh, I guess the implementation is very difficult. Uh, yeah, it's so... It's really big, uh, because uh, it's uh, very specific, or... Yeah, no, I guess because of the way that we have uh, put the security layer uh, right in at the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, and so we're using uh, uh, a very particular uh, crypto key space uh, as well. So uh, to interoperate with something like BitMessage, we would need to have uh, compatibility of key spaces and things. Uh, not necessarily impossible, but uh, at the moment we're busy enough just trying to uh, uh, to continue the development on the, the core things that we need. 
uh, to make the system work well. Okay. Um, are there, ah, I yeah. see a question. One question. The only reason you need to be rooted is to set up an access point. I will uh, repeat it. Uh, uh, he says the only reason you need to be rooted is to be able to set up an access point. Uh, no, so in fact you only need root to uh, set up ad hoc mode. Uh, most Android phones, unless you are unfortunate enough to be uh, in America, uh, will let you uh, enable an access point uh, without root access. Uh, most I say, not all. Uh, and so that's kind of our fallback if you don't have a mesh extender and you don't have root, then uh, the phones will alternate between being Wi-Fi clients and Wi-Fi access points. Um, and you know, it, it's not perfect, uh, but uh, compared to no chance of communication, eh, we think it's better than nothing. Does this uh, answer? Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, if I got it correctly, one of the main purposes of the project was to become handy in case of a disaster. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. So, so that was the uh, the cause. But we soon realised as well that this can help people in developing countries, in rural, remote areas. Uh, people uh, deep indoors, like in the hospital near my place, uh, like, you know, <laughs> it's a giant Faraday cage, basically. Um, or if maybe if you're working in a mine or something like that, then, uh, you know, it's, it, it can work in a lot of places. Yep. But, you know, um, with this purpose and some of those you mentioned, uh, I don't see uh, why there is so many focus in this security. Because in case of the, these events, uh, you most probably are eager to be heard instead of to be, I mean, you want to be wide rather than narrow. So, uh, why is too many focus on the security part? Uh, okay, so in fact, it, it, it turns out that security in a disaster situation is tremendously important. Uh, so, a disaster situation where you have uh, militia and you just have a, a general breakdown in law and order, uh, effectively there are large numbers of, uh, and excuse the, the, the pseudo-military terminology, of uh, you know, uh, informal uh, combatants uh, who are around who want to deprive you of your liberty, your possessions, and possibly your life. Uh, and certainly in Haiti this was uh, the case. And uh, so this is one reason why you may want to communicate securely with your circle of peers, to say, hey, we're going to meet at location X at time Y, uh, I'm putting the spare food in location X, we have this much fuel. These are all things that uh, you actually have tremendous need uh, to keep private. But actually one of the, uh, the interesting things of working with Red Cross, so they do a lot of medical work obviously, um, privacy laws, and particularly around confidentiality of medical records, uh, don't turn off during a disaster. In fact, very few laws turn off even during a proclaimed disaster. And so. Um, you know, there's a growing realisation in the, uh, uh, the disaster relief communi uh, community that you know, talking about someone's case notes over HF radio uh, in the clear so that everyone for a thousand miles can hear, uh, maybe that actually doesn't really meet the, uh, you know, the, the data uh, privacy directive, for example. Uh, and so uh, we think actually in a, a lot of situations security is important. What you want to do though is to not prevent people from communicating, and this comes back to as you say about uh, wanting to be heard uh, and why. And so one of the, you know, the, the ways that we achieve that, if I want to call someone on the mesh and I don't know their network ID, all I know is their phone number and I dial that, uh, the mesh will actually respond with all of the network IDs of phones that are claiming to have that phone number. Uh, now maybe you know, you're trying to ring your mum to make sure she's safe after a, an earthquake uh, and like three uh, options come up. Um, we show all of those to you and basically you can go through them in turn and you can talk to the person on the other end and go like, hmm, is that my mum? You know, you can say, you know, what's your mother's maiden name? Or, you know, turn over your credit card and tell me the last three digits on the back. You can do those things that uh, the insurance companies normally do to you uh, and find out and go like, you know, yeah, like that's my mum. Or hang on a minute, no, my mum doesn't have a credit card, so it can't be her. Uh, and then you can remember uh, the network ID and then you can use that forever after but we err on the side of letting people connect but be fully informed that the connection that we're offering is not authenticated until they've actually done so. Does it answer your question? Yeah, sure. um, are there any more questions? No okay. luck for iOS I guess. 
Sorry, could you... No, luck for Apple iPhone users. Uh, right is there a serval for iOS? Uh, no, at this stage, if uh, some kind volunteer developers would like to port it for us, that would be absolutely fabulous. Um, or if you know some kind of benefactor would like to fund us to do it ourselves, uh, that would also be very welcome indeed. Um, so, and, and here we get into an interesting point in terms of uh, you know the topic of the day around software freedom. To port to iOS, you must be able to release the software under a non-GPL license uh, in order to put it into a uh, an app on uh, on iPhone. Um, this is really, really annoying, um, but we have managed to so far keep the ability to do that. The core serval uh, daemon program uh, we release under GPL, uh, but serval project Inc. Uh, and the university, Flinders University here and uh, serval project Petrachi Limited collectively owns all of the copyright uh, in that program. So we can dual license, uh, you know, for example, to have a you know, we can basically actually issue a specific license to Apple for the sole purpose of including it uh, uh, in an app uh, available on their store. Uh, or of course, you, know, you could make it an app that only works on jailbroken apps uh, without compromising uh, the GPL. Uh, and it's one of those, well, we actually agonise over that quite a lot because uh, we don't like uh, stepping back from uh, you know, a, a pure GPL uh, licensing arrangement, uh, but we, we ended up coming to the conclusion that uh, our objective, our primary objective is to save lives uh, and uh, alleviate hardship and atrocities uh, during disasters and for that uh, it is necessary to make this uh, very annoying uh, and uh, slightly uncomfortable compromise so that we can support uh, all of the, uh, the people who are using iPhone. Uh, and also the same goes for Windows Mobile, in fact, as well. Is there one last question? One last question. Okay. The last one. Okay. Are your shoes compatible <laughs> with Serval? Are, are your shoes compatible with Serval? <laughs> <laughs> no, sadly, I need to, uh, uh, to revisit the shoe phone if I want to uh, uh, make that compatible with Serval. Uh, that would be a, a very fun thing to do though, and uh, uh, one day. So I need to find a smaller Android phone than we have uh, that can fit into the uh, uh, the space in the shoe phone. Okay. But do you still have the shoe phone? Uh, yeah, I do. Uh, I suspect my wife is asleep, otherwise I could go into the room and I could, uh, uh, could get it and show you. Uh, but in terms of slightly surprising things, let me just uh, uh, walk out here. Uh, so remember, of course, uh, I'm, I'm not in, uh, uh, in the Netherlands uh, and I'm not in Denmark, uh, but I think you have uh, some very nice things with your culture, uh, one of which, uh, once the light comes on, ah, where are we? Uh, I'm not sure if you can see, uh, we're further away, you see my buck feet? <laughs> <laughs> So unfortunately it's not quite so flat here as in, uh, in Amsterdam, so I have to ride uh, up an altitude of 140 metres uh, every day uh, with the buck feet, so that keeps me very fit. <laughs> cool. Found your shoe phone, or uh, no? I, I think I think when my wife has gone to bed, so um, uh, unfortunately we have to take a, a rain check on that one. But if you go to uh, realshoephone.com, mm -hmm. uh, I have a, a bunch of pictures, so you can see me there uh, uh, with the shoe phone, uh, including in a Boeing 747 on my way into San Francisco. Uh, I managed to wear it all the way from Adelaide uh, into San Francisco. Uh, through you know in all the aircraft and everything, uh, and this was several years after 9/11. Uh, I did do some preparations first to make sure I wouldn't end up in a jail, um, but it turned out to be surprisingly easy to arrange to fly with a shoe phone. How do I start the browser in here? Uh, uh, Realshoephone.org. Uh, dot com. Oh, dot com. Ik ben geen Mac hier, ik weet niet wat. 
And there are a couple of videos as well of uh, some of the, the news coverage and things that we had with the shoe phone too. But you should be able to see the, uh, uh, the the crazy picture of me there in the uh, the airplane with the phone. It doesn't want to. Uh, I transfer you the uh, the image of me with yeah, the shoe phone. Yeah, but we uh, we see it, but. Uh, Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we see your uh, shoe phone. <laughs> but um, if you don't mind, we uh, stop here. Yeah, no. And, uh, no worries. Then uh, we uh, thank you. So uh, please uh, an applause for Paul. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, the next time you're in the Netherlands, you're getting your bottle of wine. <laughs> so, uh, Thank you. Yeah, if you win a prize again, uh, give a ring. Uh, yeah, no, I, I hope I can get to, back to Amsterdam again. You have a, a lovely city there, it's, uh, it's very nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah he is quite <laughs> often uh, apparently in Amsterdam, Amsterdam, so if, uh, if people want to meet you somehow, they uh, should come. Uh, or if you like, come to Australia. Yeah, very nice. Also, I'm sure we can find you a spare bed. Yeah, I'm uh, quitting uh, Skype now. Sure, no worries. You will have a, a lovely afternoon. Yeah. Thank you. Um, bye bye. Uh, <laughs>